Today we're going to learn about how control flow works in Clojure. Things like if and else and switch statements and so forth. First, let's learn about how to create variables. And variables is a misleading name. They're not variable because everything in Clojure is by default immutable. But we can create a symbol called x and we can assign that symbol a value. There are two ways to do this. The first is to use def, as I've done here. And the second is to use let. Let allows us to create a binding that is only valid within the parentheses surrounding the let. So let's say x is Steve. Here we can see that Steve is printed instead of the x that we defined outside. But if we get the value of x outside of that, it is what we defined above. It's the global x. And let will allow us to create bindings to symbols and make our code a little simpler. An if statement in Clojure is a lot like any other piece of Clojure code. It starts with if, the symbol representing the macro that is if, and it has a predicate. In this case, let's just say empty with x back to remind us what x is. And then it takes two branches. It will take what we do if the predicate is true, and what if it's false. And so here we've evaluated the whole thing but only the branch that matches is ever evaluated. So you can do actual work in both branches and be assured that they won't both get evaluated before calling. And that's because if functions as a macro as opposed to a function. And a macro just means that it can control the evaluation of its arguments. It's called before its arguments and can manipulate them to do whatever and evaluate them or not, as in this case. For the predicate, we expect a Boolean value but all the logic functions in Clojure will expect something they call falsy. And a falsy value can be either literally false, or it can be nil, which is Clojure's way of saying null. And you'll see a lot of nils in Clojure. Clojure is not shy about creating nil references, and most of the Clojure functions will deal quite logically with nulls, such as if. You can say if nil, and see that nil is treated as a false value. If we want to do more than one thing within the context of one of the branches of the if, we can use a special construct called do. And do will let us do more than one thing. In this case, evaluate more than one expression. We can, for example, print something to the console and then return a different value. So that returned OK, and we can see that our console has OK in it as well. Normally, you would only use do to invoke a side effect of some sort something like printing to a console or writing to a database or reading from a file or something else that involves not just the inputs and outputs of your function. And so this is something that functional programming tries to avoid and does so with various success. But if you can avoid using do, you probably should, whether your code could be better represented as a pipeline of values into values. But for things like logging, consider it a perfectly reasonable thing to do. And in this case, we could simplify our whole branch by using if not, which is just a shortcut that reverses the order of arguments. And for both if and if not, we can leave out the second case. So again, we return OK, and OK is again printed because we've used if not. And in this case, we can use instead of if, when not. And when not just takes all of the statements. It pretends to be a one branch if and wraps everything in an implicit do. So we won't have to put the do in ourselves. And once again, the same thing we expect to see is printed. And of course, as you might expect, when operates as the inverse of when not. Besides if and when, we can express more complicated situations by using case. And case is like a switch statement that you might have seen in other languages. So we give it a predicate. And then the predicate is compared using the equality operator equals to each of the cases that we give it. So we pass pairs of comparisons for predicates, then the value that we expect to see. And then we can optionally pass a final value that will return if nothing matches. So here we see hello because x is hello, as we've seen above. And if we change the predicate to not match, we get the final thing that we pass case. For even more complicated matching, we have a construct called cond. And cond is a conditional that does not require a predicate, but you write your own. So you can imitate case this way. Or you can do something else. Let's say we can check something silly like this. And then for cond, there's no default argument, but you can just 
say otherwise for one of your cases. And this will make it pretty obvious what you intend, because otherwise will be evaluated as true and will always match whatever. And of course, you have to put otherwise last, or nothing below it will ever be called, because otherwise is always true. And here we see a bug, which of course I meant to do, in that reverse x has not matched what we thought it would. And when we evaluate reverse x, we see that we've got a list of characters rather than a string because reverse expects to operate in a list. So just by way of example of sort of working through things, see how this goes. And using apply, which takes a function and then a list of arguments and calls that function with those arguments, we can create what we expected to see in the first place and drop it right back where we meant to put it. So those are control structures in Clojure. You'll notice we haven't discussed loose, which is usually the other thing that everyone discusses with if and else. And that's because in Clojure, loops are an edge case. And usually we'll use other collection processing functions to deal with those. 